Uh, tonight is another lecture in our, in our uh, Stanley and Arlene Ginsberg Family Foundation Lecture Series. I want to thank uh, Stan Ginsberg for sponsoring this series. Please join me. <laughs> I also want to thank our host, uh, Gwen Borowski, the director of the National Liberty Museum, who couldn't be here with us tonight, but has been a perfect host for all of these lectures. And also, uh, Val Kogan, uh, the head of the Mid-Atlantic uh, uh, Eurasia Business Council, who is also co-sponsoring tonight's event. Uh, when we... Uh, titled this lecture back in August, A New Cold War, the West and Russia. Uh, that's what everybody was talking about in response to uh, Soviet, uh, Russian activities in Ukraine. Uh, now people seem to be talking about a new detente. So uh, I guess the speaker today will help us decide whether we're in a new cold war or a new detente uh, or something else uh, altogether. Um, I note uh, that our speaker is, from, is a professor of national security affairs from the U.S. Naval War College, and it just occurs to me today that he is our fifth speaker in this lecture series from the U.S. Naval War College. Uh, we had Toshi Yoshihara uh, on China, Timothy Hoyt on India, Pakistan, John Mora on uh, Churchill in World War I, Charles Adel on um, the grand strategy of John Quincy Adams. So uh, tonight, uh, Nick Gavastev uh, is a former editor of the National Interest magazine and a uh, frequent commentator on Russian and Eurasian affairs. He's appeared in all the major uh, periodicals, Foreign Affairs, Financial Times, the Los Angeles Times. He's been on CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, which is quite a group of stations to be on all at once. Uh, not to mention National Public Radio and the BBC. He received his doctorate from uh, St. Anthony's College, Oxford University, and uh, I'm going to ask you to welcome Nick Kovazdev. Thanks, Alan. Well, I hope I uh, do our Newport contingent proud by continuing a good uh, a uh, round of uh, lecture presentations, uh, of course, coming from Newport, coming from the uh, Naval War College, I do have to start with the disclaimer that my remarks tonight will be my own personal opinions, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Navy or of the U.S. government, and uh, that will probably become apparent as we uh, make our way through the evening. Um, even if we didn't have the uh, tragic attacks in Paris this past week, uh, there is an irony that two days ago, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Paris summit. And this event actually was going to go by without much notice. Because this was the summit 25 years ago that was supposed to put an end to the Cold War. It led to the Charter for a New Europe, which was supposed to prevent a Cold War from ever happening again. Uh, the fact that this anniversary, even before the attacks, was not going to be commemorated. There were no symposia. You weren't going to have former statesmen being convened 25 years later to talk about their achievement in Paris in 1990 speaks to the topic of tonight's presentation as to whether or not we are, in fact, moving towards a new Cold War. Notwithstanding Alan's point that we may be on the verge of a new detente, which, of course, presumes that there's a new Cold War in place because you can't have a new detente <laughs> unless there was a new Cold War to begin with. Uh, but it does reflect the fact that much of the optimism in 1990 that we had come to the end of the Cold War and that we were creating new structures in the Euro-Atlantic and greater Eurasian regions to prevent this from ever happening again, that Europe would not be divided, that there would not be uh, a sense, sorry, do I need to, all right, I just saw signaling in the back, that's why I didn't know if something wasn't uh, registering that if we, uh, we were trying to prevent this from happening again, and if we're having this discussion, then it begs the question, did the Paris process fail? Did the attempts in Paris in 1990 with the Charter for a New Europe, what was called the Peace Conference of the Last Cold War, did it fail ultimately in what it was attempting to do? Uh, 
And in order to answer that question and to answer this question of whether or not we're in a new Cold War, we do have to go back and examine how we got into the first Cold War, what got us started. Because there are several unanswered questions, unsettled questions about how that Cold War started and how it ended. Plenty of books, articles, symposia on the origins of the Cold War. We could have years of discussion on it. Let me just give you some of the bumper sticker summaries when people are asked the question, what started the first Cold War after World War II? You generally get three broad responses. The first is that the Cold War emerged because of Soviet ideology and expansionism, that the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin remained a revolutionary state. It sought to spread its ideology around the world uh, that it was seeking to do this uh, after World War II. We, of course, have the famous conversation uh, with Stalin uh, that uh, Milovan Zhilas, the Yugoslav communist, recorded that Stalin said that in the aftermath of World War II, every power would spread their social system as far as their armies could reach, and that uh, wherever the Soviet Union could extend its influence, it would of necessity seek to impose a Marxist-Leninist system. And so this answer says it is rooted in the Soviet system, it is rooted in Soviet ideology, this was the cause of the Cold War. There were others, a second answer, who said Soviet ideology was simply uh, the latest fad or coloring, but that the Cold War fundamentally is a product of geopolitics, that the imperatives of the Russian state are such that it would be led into conflict with particularly the maritime powers of Europe and of North America, a struggle for supremacy in the Euro and Eurasian regions, and that, yes, communism provided an ideological coloring, but really fundamentally this was just a repeat of geopolitical conflicts that have been traced throughout history, whether it's uh, the empire of the czars seeking expansion uh, into Europe uh, or uh, imperialist struggles in the uh, period prior to World War I, and therefore the roots of the Cold War were to be found in the nature and structure of the Russian state. It's imperative to expand, it's imperative uh, to secure trade and communication routes. The third answer, uh, obviously not one heard much in the United States, but which was heard certainly in the Soviet Union and in some circles in Europe, is that the Cold War uh, was the United, fault of the United States, that Stalin could have worked out an equilibrium with the European powers. We know this from 1944 in the famous meeting between Stalin and Churchill with the blue pencil percentage deal of uh, Churchill and Stalin dividing up uh, Central and Eastern Europe with percentages of who would have uh, what percentage, and that if the United States hadn't intervened, or interfered that Europe and the Soviet Union could have worked out some equilibrium over time. Uh, as we now know from more documentary uh, evidence that has emerged since the uh, fall of the Soviet Union, uh, that doesn't appear to be a uh, accurate rendition of what was being done, but nevertheless that third answer still resonates with people who then want to believe that the United States was playing a role in stoking the first Cold War. So how did the Cold War get started? Second question, how does it end? And generally there are two answers that are provided. One is that the Soviet Union lost, Soviet ideology and the economic system went bankrupt, they were unable to sustain competition with the West, uh, and that this is a straightforward victory for the United States and for the Western world. A uh, view you often hear in the United States uh, not exclusively, but that's generally the American paradigm in viewing the end of the Cold War. Uh, the second answer that's put forward is that, yes, the Soviet Union was losing. It was in the weaker position, but that the Soviet Union and the peoples of the Soviet Union, uh, both the other nationalities, but then in the end the, Russian, the Russians themselves, realized that they couldn't sustain this competition, but they brought the Cold War voluntarily to an end, they conceded, but they did so in a way that they hoped that it was not really a victory of one side over the other, uh, but uh, an ending of this Cold War by negotiation 
uh, where there really weren't going to be victors and vanquished, uh, but that everyone would move forward uh, in terms of developing a new European security order. Why I bring these points up is that these aren't simply arguments that are made in academic common rooms and of interest only to historians and professors. Uh, each of these answers has profound policy implications. So that, for example, if you lean towards the answer that it is Soviet ideology that was the cause of the Cold War, the Soviet system, and you also lean towards the answer that it was Russia and the other nationalities of the Soviet Union freeing themselves from this ideology which brings an end to the Cold War, that will then lead you to certain policy choices when the Cold War ends. Because if it's, not, if it's the Soviet ideology, then helping Russia overcome Soviet ideology as quickly as possible, pushing for democratization, but also saying that Russia as a country is not a threat, bring Russia into the European and Euro-Atlantic security orders, make it a partner, give it status, give it a place in the way that was done uh, with France after the Napoleonic Wars. That's one set of policy options. If, on the other hand, you lean towards uh, the other set of answers, that the Cold War was a straightforward victory of Western institutions and that the Cold War is rooted in long-term Russian geopolitical imperatives, that leads you to a different set of policy options. It means that if the Cold War ends with the collapse of the Soviet Union, you need to take advantage of that breathing space because when the Russians come back, if they have these certain geopolitical imperatives, when they come back, they will seek to regain that imperative. So you need to consolidate the Euro-Atlantic core. You need to expand the institutions uh, as far east as possible. You need to reach out to the uh, states that were part of the Soviet bloc and bring them into the Euro-Atlantic world as quickly as possible. Uh, and you assume that at some point in the future, if there's a recovery in Russia, that recovery will tend to be negative. So the West then had a choice after the 1990s. And policymakers had to decide which of these interpretations they were going to adopt for policy. And as often happens, particularly in the US context, uh, we chose not to give definitive answers to any of those questions. <laughs> we wanted to go for what we often refer to in the academic literature as the satisficing compromises, which is those who said it's about Soviet ideology and Russia is a friend, and those that said, no, it's about geopolitics and we really have to expand. We have to reap the fruits of victory of the Cold War to kind of uh, not be back in this position again. Neither side got everything that they wanted, so we ended up with uh, a series of policies in the 1990s and beyond that kind of tried to square the circle, split the difference between these two approaches. And then also wanting to bring in European partners who also sometimes adopted that third answer that I mentioned, that looked at the Cold War and said, well, maybe the Soviets were at fault, but maybe you Americans were at fault as well, and you Americans have a way of getting involved in European affairs and messing things up for us. Certainly, we hear this from segments of the European left. Increasingly, we hear it from segments now of the European right, that the United States uh, is not always a positive or constructive force when it comes to Europe's relationship with post-Soviet Russia. So starting in 1990, 1991, we decided that we would adopt a series of policies towards Russia as the successor state, towards the other states that succeeded uh, in the Soviet Union and towards what was formally referred to as the Soviet bloc. Uh, and what I like to uses, again, bumper sticker, shorthand for our policies was uh, we satisficed towards an approach which we might term expansion without commitment. That is, we agreed to start expanding Euro-Atlantic institutions eastward to start bringing in former Soviet bloc states, to start bringing in the Baltic states. We then also thought perhaps to other former Soviet republics that could be brought into the European Union and into NATO. But what I mean by expansion without commitment is that we undertook this process with the assumption that these commitments would never be tested. 
the assumption was that it was easy to support expansion because no one expected that we would be called upon to defend those commitments. We assumed that Russia was permanently weak, that Russia was debilitated, that Russia may not like these things, but it really wouldn't have, one of two things would happen. Either Russia wouldn't have the power or Russia would come around to our way of thinking. When you look at, for example, the debate on ratifying the Washington Treaty in 1949 in the Senate, very contentious debate in the Senate. Do we want to ratify this alliance? Do we want to make these commitments, these binding commitments to the security of European states? And then you look at the rounds of NATO expansion going through the Senate in the 1990s and the 2000s, where it was almost on voice votes, uh, almost as an afterthought. Sure, we're going to expand NATO. That fits into this point about expansion without commitment. People supported it because they didn't think at the end of the day uh, they would be challenged on it. They would have to actually fulfill these commitments. Same thing with the European Union. Expanding the European Union at a time when Europe was doing well, its economies were doing well, it didn't have a migration crisis, the single currency after 1999 seemed to be doing well. It was sold to populations in Western Europe as cost-free. We can expand, we can bring in new members, your basic core interests won't be affected. Now, of course, we see that now that there is a challenge, we see populations being uh, less supportive. The opinion polling, particularly that's been done in Western Europe on NATO commitments is very disheartening with populations saying that even if there's an Article 5 guarantee for, say, one of the Baltic states, that they shouldn't, uh, their country shouldn't necessarily live up to that commitment. Uh, those who have been going to conferences and other events talk about a sense of buyer's remorse in parts of Western Europe uh, that uh, maybe we shouldn't have expanded so quickly or brought in all of this at the time. Uh, and then, of course, some blame of the United States, which, of course, you hear in some European states. It was the Americans who forced this expansion on us. We never really supported it, uh, and now we have to live up with the consequences. So we had this expansion without commitment approach, which is now running into difficulty. The other thing which we tried to square the circle, which was give Russia, and as the term was, give Russia a voice without a veto. Let them come into Euro-Atlantic institutions and be a member, but in order to reassure others, let them have a peace, but don't give them a sense, tell the others, well, don't worry, the Russians don't actually have any real power here, that they can complain, they can say why they don't like something, we'll hear that, and then we'll say, we'll just go on with whatever policy we were choosing to do. So this was, again, the idea that, well, we're going to expand NATO, we're going to expand the European Union, we'll also try to create, twice now NATO has done this, both times it's failed, to try to create some degree of Russia-NATO partnership, uh, where Russia has a seat at the table, and they're but it's not clear what that table is or what it means or what actual influence Russia has on the process. The European Union announced and started in the early 2000s its uh, a wider neighborhood policy and its series of expanded dialogues with Russia, and you still have this biannual uh, Russia-EU summit, uh, but at the same time, Russia's not part of the EU and it can register its complaints, but then it doesn't really have say in the organizations. And so that also became an unsatisfying compromise. As I mentioned before, these two policies worked to some extent in the 1990s because uh, Russia was on the weaker side, it was dealing with the impacts of the Soviet collapse, and there was some optimism that sooner or later Russia would come around to accepting these new realities in Europe. What was not as anticipated was that Russia would undergo a resurgence. And so we had, when Russia starts its resurgence after the financial collapse of 1998, but certainly after 2001-2002, uh, and we discover that Russia has greater capabilities and that Russia does not necessarily agree with how things have unfolded, uh, that put our policy into a bit of an impasse. What happened in Russia during this time is also interesting. So if the Western strategy satisficing compromise was expansion without commitment, voice without a veto, on the Russian side you had uh, a similar approach to try to come to grips with what a post-Cold War world would look like. 
And the Russians had the advantage of a narrative that came together much sooner. Uh, in the early 1990s, you had some in the Russian establishment that accepted and said Russia lost the Cold War, Russia needs to remodel its institutions along Western lines. It needs to go through a process of Westernization. It needs to uh, acquiesce to a Western-led security order. Uh, but by the mid-1990s, this actually occurs within the Yeltsin administration, not within the Putin administration. Putin builds on this, but this trend, trend was already beginning in the mid-1990s. And that is uh, Russia's response could be uh, categorized as uh, the hope of partnership for privilege. That is, Russia would uh, show its willingness to partner and support the West in return, hoping to gain some privileges at the table. Privileges in the former Soviet space, privileges in the running of the international order. Uh, in the 1990s, because Russia was weak, uh, generally Russia had to cooperate with the West in order to have any hope of having any influence. So for example, in Yugoslavia in the 1990s, Russia agrees to take part in NATO-led operations in Bosnia and Kosovo uh, in order to have some influence on how things will develop in the former Yugoslavia. Russia accedes to a US-driven Middle East peace process in order to at least still have a seat at the table. But as Russia begins to recover, the equation shifts. If it was partnership in the hope of privilege, now it's the hope of privilege. And if privilege is not given, then withdrawing partnership. And the window for this shift occurs because of 9-11. Uh, then, because of what happens on September 11th, Russia now becomes, or is seen as becoming more important, that Russia is needed for the war on terror, that Russia is needed to help solve some of these uh, lingering security problems, whether it's the Iran nuclear program, or the getting the six-party talks started in North Korea, uh, or dealing with proliferation of nuclear weapons. And so this becomes a way for Russia now to try to use that as a way to gain more leverage uh, against the West. Putin is willing, as we saw in 2001, to really put forward this bargain partnership for privilege, recognize more of Russia's interests in the former Soviet space, recognize uh, a degree of Russian interest in other parts of the world for greater cooperation. But starting in 2003, if he does not believe, and if the Russian establishment believes that they're not getting enough privilege for the partnership that they're offering, they also begin to shift to a second strategy, and that is to test Western commitment. So if the West was beginning to expand, but without giving much of a commitment, the Russians increasingly become willing to do a dual track policy, partnership for privilege, but also testing the degree of Western commitment, which is the, the West, the United States, NATO, the European Union, say that these are certain things that they want to do. How strong is their commitment? We have the tests, the opening shots in Moldova in 2003, Rose Revolution in Georgia 2004, Orange Revolution in Ukraine, uh, 2003, Orange Revolution in Ukraine 2004, and where you begin to see the Russian efforts of how far is the West really willing to go here? And how much is their rhetoric not backed up by action? Uh, the Georgia conflict of 2008 uh, is a direct outgrowth of this, particularly after the uh, Bucharest NATO summit where you have NATO saying that Georgia and Ukraine uh, will eventually become members of NATO, and then a Russian test to see how deep that Western commitment is. Uh, and so in that regard, the crisis that we have seen in Ukraine should not have been a surprise. Anyone who has been caught by surprise by what happened in Ukraine uh, at the end of 2013 onward uh, was missing signs of this Russian willingness to test Western commitment and to see how far the West was willing to go in order to uh, maintain these commitments, while simultaneously still holding out the prospect of partnership uh, for privilege. This week, President Hollande will be, uh, this will be the latest test. We'll see this unfold in real time, because President Hollande will come here to Washington, then he goes to Moscow to talk about partnership in fighting ISIS and stabilizing the Middle East. This will be a test of how far, in this case, will the French president go and will other European leaders go 
in modulating their stance, say, on Ukraine or on other issues in order to get a working partnership with Russia. We had very mixed signals from the G20 summit in Antalya this past week, uh, where the strongest con uh, condemnation of Russia on Ukraine came from uh, Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada. Every other Western leader very muted, if bringing it up at all. We had, of course, had, for the first time in a long time, uh, both sides releasing very positive images of President Obama and President Putin conversing together after several summits of where the body language was very clear that uh, they were not getting along. Uh, we, of course, have the Hollande initiative. But we also heard in Antalya, supposedly, that uh, the United States and its European partners agreed that they will continue sanctions on Ukraine. That's an understanding. The real test comes in January when the European Commission has to decide whether to extend those sanctions for another six months or not. So that's where we are with some of the geopolitics. Let me touch on a few other issues uh, that are also feeding into this question of where the US, Russia, and the Western relationship with Russia are going. Uh, one of the things, of course, is that uh, in contrast to the atmosphere we had in 1990 when there was a sense that there was growing trust between the two sides, uh, when uh, their positive messages were coming out. We really today see a real lack of trust. Uh, leaders on both sides uh, in the United States, in Europe, and then in Russia don't trust each other. They don't trust their assurances. Uh, some of this also, of course, comes from uh, a problem that we in the United States have been slow to deal with, and that is the reality that it is impossible in today's media environment to segment messages. And what I mean by this is that we can no longer, as we have been used to in the past, be able to say one thing to one party and one thing to another party and hope that they never, those messages never communicate. So let me take one issue of, of trust today and messaging and also how some of what is driving this isn't always Russia and the United States, but also problems in our own uh, domestic allocation of resources and our willingness to prioritize. Ever since uh, the early 2000s, first with the Bush administration saying that the US was going to have to pay a much greater degree of attention and resources to the Middle East, that we had let the Middle East fester for too long and we really had to concentrate on the Middle East. And then afterwards, the Obama administration saying we've let the Asia Pacific drift for too long. The United States was really focused its attention there. That's great. Those are both good policy choices to make. The problem that you have then is that somewhere you're going to have to draw resources away. And in both cases, the Bush and then Obama administration said Europe was the place we were going to pull resources and attention from. We could no longer give Europe the degree of interest and focus that we had done during the Cold War and in the 1990s because now we had bigger fish to fry in other parts of the world. However, we wanted to still signal to European allies, particularly to new allies in Eastern Europe who were jittery about this idea of American withdrawal, that we were still committed to their security. And so we thought we had hit on a perfect solution to the problem, and that was theater ballistic missile defense. That we had this problem with Iran potentially developing a nuclear weapon, potentially, and certainly not potentially, developing ballistic missile technology, and so saying that we can, in a sense, kill two birds with one stone, we could deploy a theater missile defense system in Europe that would be designed to deal with an Iranian threat, but would also signal, particularly to countries like Poland and Romania, that we were invested in their security because we would base assets, ships, uh, launchers, radars in Eastern Europe. So you could have a very small American footprint, but one that was significant. Of course, we told the Russians, that this is a system designed to deal with a threat from Iran. And former Defense Secretary Gates at one point even indicated a willingness to suggest to the Russians that we wouldn't even activate this system unless there was a confirmed threat from Iran. So it kind of solved two problems. We could message to allies, we're committed to you, we're going to put this theater missile system in place. But we message to the Russians, you're not threatened by this. This isn't directed against you. This is directed against an Iranian threat. Well, now we have an Iran deal. And whatever you may think about the Iran deal, there's a reality that there's an agreement. And that agreement has been sold to Middle Eastern states, Europeans, and Americans as solving the Iran nuclear problem. 
at least for the foreseeable future. So now the question is what happens to theater missile defense? Either you have one of three unpleasant options. You can either say, we don't really believe that this agreement's going to work, so we have to keep theater missile defense in place as a hedge, which then undercuts all of the messaging that the White House has been giving about the deal over the last four months. You can suggest that, uh, the deal, that there's a new threat. You now have to say, well, but there's another threat that's emerging that theater missile defense is meant to deal with. Or you have to say, this was really an effort to reassure allies in Eastern Europe that are jittery about uh, Russian intentions, given the fact that we are still drawing down our land forces in Europe. We're only doing rotational deployments. We're still continuing to pivot to Asia Pacific. And to say, yes, this was designed for an Iran threat. The Iran threat is gone, but there's still a problem with Russia, so we still need to keep these systems in place uh, in order to reassure allies which then, of course, the Russians say, well, then we were right all along to oppose these deployments because really you're telling us that they're directed uh, against us. So we now run into that messaging problem, and that contributes to this lack of trust. It contributes to the more hostile atmosphere that you see in relations between uh, certainly the United States and Russia. Two other factors that have changed since the 1990s, which are also important, and I'll end on the, with these two factors as they play out. Uh, the first is that uh, in 1990, all the way through the year 2000, when you looked at the world order, there was really only one game in town. That was the Euro-Atlantic world. You wanted finance, you wanted technology, you wanted trade. That was the hub was the United States and its Western European allies. What's happened over the last 20 years, of course, is that the world order is uh, becoming more multipolar. Financial power, economic power, political power, military power is diffusing. The West still has predominance, but it's not the only game in town anymore. And we saw the difference between uh, sanctions against Iran in the 1990s that the U.S. could impose, but it was only, only you had to get everyone else suddenly involved, now, not only the Europeans, but the Chinese and the Indians and the Russians for those things to truly work. And so today, if the Russians feel that partnership with the West is inviolable, you have some who say, well, we now have new options. We can go to the Chinese. We can go to India. We have uh, our new relationship with the BRICS. Uh, the fact that Russia was brought into the G7 to become the G8 in the 1990, which was very important symbolically for Russia. This was seen as Russia still being a major power. Russia was ejected from the G8, coming back to the G7. And the Russian response was, well, we have the BRICS now, and we have the G20. You know, the, the West isn't necessarily the only game in town. The other is that we have seen over the last several years is a return of an ideological component which people thought was done with at the end of the last Cold War. And this isn't about communism versus capitalism, but it has to do with things such as, is there such a thing as universal standards? Or do different countries and cultures get to arrange human rights, political rights, uh, according to different cultural matrices? So that therefore what works in the United States, what works in Denmark, what works in Sweden, doesn't necessarily apply to Russia or China or Iran, or South Africa? Uh, are there different definitions of what it means to be a democracy? Uh, the Russians have become big proponents and have spearheaded this, the idea that uh, there is no such thing as a universal standard on human rights. There are very basic human rights that are universal, but everything else is culturally determined. And the United States and Western Europe don't have the right to speak for the rest of the human race, the rest of the world. And they found a receptive audience in other parts of the world to that argument. We now see in the UN Security Council, we see at the G20 that there is a growing divide between the West, plus Japan, and the non-West, the rise of the rest, the rise of the non-Western world. Uh, and the Russians are uh, capitalizing on that to try to uh, gain some advantage. And so with that, we now have some of these ideological issues now coming back uh, into the game between Russia and the West. Uh, and the Russians, of course, not only in their communications with the rest of the world, but also reaching out back to the new right in Europe, that you have you know, cultural distinctiveness ought to be preserved, that there shouldn't be this uh, 
cultural homogenization around human rights that's occurring, and finding some, even in Europe, finding receptive audiences, and in the United States as well in certain, in certain circles. And I think that's something to, to pay attention to. So the question is, are we in a new Cold War with Russia? Are we uh, in a quasi-Cold War with Russia? We haven't certainly reached the stage of uh, the last Cold War. Uh, there are still many things that are positive in the world order. Uh, we certainly have very heightened disagreements, uh, but we haven't yet reached the stage of a new Cold War. But that could change, and these are some of the drivers I'll leave with you for the future that we'll need to pay attention. The first is whether or not the Russia-China relationship consolidates. If you have the emergence of a true Eurasian entente between Beijing and Moscow, where there is greater agreement, where there is greater security and economic cooperation, fueled by an ideological approach that rejects the idea that the West gets to set the agenda, that could lead to a tenser global order. Right now, we are still in flux because the Chinese haven't yet decided whether their relationship with the West is more important to them than their relationship with Russia. Within Russia, over the last year, we've seen that uh, this initial wave of enthusiasm for going east to China has been diminished, partly because the Chinese cannot deliver economically the same way that the West can, and also some concerns about whether Russia uh, would become too junior of a partner in a Chinese-led system, that maybe there are some advantages to trying to still partner with the United States uh, and with Europe. But that's one thing I think we need to, to pay attention on. Right now, we have two gambles in place. Right now, the Russian gamble, Putin's gamble, uh, and certainly we'll see this uh, in play when Olan comes to visit, is that the West cannot sustain its current position vis-a-vis -vis Russia, that the West eventually will have to come to Moscow and start to bargain. They'll bargain on Ukraine, not necessarily that Ukraine is completely abandoned, but this idea of Ukraine as neutral space or somehow existing between Russia and the Eurasian community and the European Union, that there'll be a compromise on Syria, that yes, maybe Assad eventually will go, but there'll be a coalition and the Russian equities will be preserved and that Russia just needs to continue to hold out, that Russia can hold out against sanctions a while longer, that all it has to do is outweigh the United States and Western Europe, and sooner or later the West will come to bargain, and partnership with some degree of privilege can be restored. The Western gamble is that Russia cannot sustain its present course, that sooner or later Russia cannot sustain what it has done in Ukraine, it cannot sustain what it has done in Syria, it will not find relief from China uh, that is acceptable on Russian terms and that Russia will have to back down uh, and will have to start negotiating with the West in a different way. Uh, the Russian gamble is the West comes to Moscow and accedes to Moscow's demands. This approach says within a year or two years, the strain in the Russian economy will be such that Russia will have to make significant concessions, will have to accept uh, the security order that has emerged in Europe over the last 20 or some years uh, and have to learn to live with it. Uh, so in that way, the clocks are running, and the question will be which one runs out first. Uh, and when it does, uh, then you'll have an answer to the question as to whether or not we're in a new Cold War with Russia. All right. I hope that I can't wait to hear the end of that story. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're open for questions. Uh, Peyton will come around with the microphone. Please wait till she gets to you and uh, speak directly into the microphone. With the embargo, with the price of oil, with the U.S. ability uh, with LNG ve vessels to better meet the needs of Europe, what are the internal pressures within Russia to try to come to accommodation uh, because of how, you know, the 90 percent or whatever the, the large percentage of people within Russia who are being hurt by these things um, are happening. Yeah. It's a great question. Uh, Russians are pursuing several different strategies to try to mitigate. One of them has been a quiet but definite opening of a dialogue with the Saudis over the past six or seven months. Uh, 
And this is very interesting because the Russians and the Saudis share a common interest in destroying North American shale production. If they can get the North American factor removed, that North American energy is simply too expensive for world markets by driving it, dry, keeping prices below the point where North American energy becomes uh, efficient, then the Russians feel that this uh, threat of North American LNG is reduced. Uh, and so they are willing to take the short-term hit in revenue along with the Saudis. The Saudis are also taking a major hit with letting oil prices be this low given their budget deficit and everything that they're spending on in the hopes that as in the 1980s they can kill uh, North American energy independence dreams. So you're seeing this interesting dialogue with the Russians and the Saudis uh, they disagree on a number of things, but they're also looking at where do they have interests. And of course, the Saudis have their relationship with us. It's a tri triangular uh, dialogue in that sense. Putin believes and the people around him believe that Russia can survive sanctions in the current drop in oil prices comfortably for about another two to three years. When you look at their reserves, uh, you also look at political mobilization in Russia on this issue, which is Yes, your standard of living was here three years ago. It's here, but remember you were here in 1998. So do you really want uh, a upheaval? And in this case, tying in also, what, what I, I will, again, this is why I'm, I, don't, I say I don't speak on behalf of the government even though the government employs me. That's the nice thing about academic freedom for our, our war colleges. Uh, our failure in Ukraine. We had a real opportunity in Ukraine when the Ukrainian revolution, when Maidan happened, to really make a major difference and to show that Ukraine, by going through this transition, would get a lot of aid and support from the West. If you look at Russian media coverage of Ukraine over the last two years, of what's happening in Ukraine proper, not in Donbass where the, where the war has been fighting, it's all about economic collapse. It's all about, see, what happened in 2004, what happened again. You have this democratic revolution, everyone talks a good game about aid from the West, but see what happens to the average Ukrainian. And so that is having an impact in Russia where Russians are saying, yeah, I don't like my standard of living here, but if I run the risk of a colored revolution, is my standard going to drop here? Do I stick with the regime that I may not like? And we know from the opinion data that there's discontent in Russia. Is it reached the point where people are willing to push for political change? And Putin believes that no, it hasn't, that they can ride this out. Some of it is by invoking nationalism. We can see this in the, uh, particularly among younger people, uh, this uh, nationalist uh, mobilization that's going on. And Putin and the people around him believe that energy prices will recover by 2017 or 2018, that they're going to be back at 60 to $80 a barrel for oil. When that happens, the Russian budget comes back into balance. You can start up the spending again, you can start the social welfare payments again, and you can survive the crisis. So um, their thinking is that, yes, short-term pain, but long-term, he still thinks he has cards that are going to produce an outcome that is ex strategically acceptable to him before they go into the next round of Russian elections in 2018. So that's kind of where I think you're at. So this, this Russia-Saudi dialogue is actually quite interesting. Um, because also both on energy but also on Syria. Uh, and you've had you know, some senior Saudis going to, to Moscow. You've had emissaries going to Riyadh. Uh, and then also with Turkey. And they're trying now to see you know, what's the possibility for compromise in Syria. So if that occurs, then you might see uh, a shift in, in terms of Saudi-Russian energy competition turning back to collusion to bring prices up from 40 to 60, 65, $70 a barrel within a year but enough to keep our North American producers uh, in the red rather than the black. What is the currency <coughs> situation globally doing to all of this? I'm, currency? The cu oh, the currency? Current, the currency? Yeah, I mean, the Russians, you know, the Russian ruble has taken a real hit. So if you, any of you were investing in the Russian ruble, my, my condolences because you've watched your ruble holdings be reduced in value by half. But the sanctions and lower energy prices have actually helped Russia in two ways. Because, because of sanctions, Russians are buying less from overseas, and it's a boon to their domestic producers, particularly in the food sector. 
and they're paying them in rubles. So it doesn't matter that the ruble is worth less because you're paying in a domestic currency. The other thing is because Russia sells energy, export energy is paid for in dollars or euros, but all of the expenses in Russia are paid in rubles. So energy prices have fallen, but because the ruble has fallen, your dollar and euro buy a lot more rubles, but your salaries haven't changed in Russia. If I'm getting paid 5,000 rubles a month from Luke Oil, I'm still getting 5,000 rubles, except now that they've sold their oil for dollars, they can get more rubles, and therefore my salary hasn't been affected. So they've been shielded to some extent. Paradoxically, the currency has fallen, but it hasn't had the impacts that some people predicted. On other currency issues, the real test has been whether or not the Russians and the Chinese will start trading in their own currencies. And there was a lot of talk of that a year ago, that they were going to stop using the dollar, that all trade was going to be between, in rubles and yuan. Um, then the Chinese kind of had their hiccup. Uh, and people, you know, Russians got a little worried that, wait, if we're going to be taking yuan and the yuan is losing value, uh, do we, and then the only thing we can do is spend it on other Chinese products. We can't buy things from Germany with yuan. So some of those plans are now in advance. Uh, the other thing, of course, that the Russians have for currencies, they are one of the world's largest gold producers. And so if you are an investor in Russian gold stocks, your investments are doing reasonably well because the Russian mining sector has been experiencing a boom year because the Kremlin is, is increasing its purchases of gold in order to help buttress the currency and then to be able to use that. So that's kind of where we are. Dropping the dollar, a lot of talk a year ago. Now that's kind of, and that's going to depend a lot more on the Chinese, I think, at this point, whether or not those plans uh, for dropping the dollar go anywhere. Would you care to comment further on cooperation with Syria and the ISIS position? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about the Russian strategy in Syria this is the problem we have in, in the U.S. Is of, of mirror imaging. We like to say, well, the Russians will do what we wanted to do in Syria, and then they're going to fail because we tried to do these things, or, or in Iraq or elsewhere. The Russian strategy in Syria has actually had two parts over the last three months, and they're proceeding on two, two approaches. The first has been they wanted to solidify Assad's control over the 20% of Syria or so that he still controls. The important thing about we get distracted that we think, oh, he only controls 20% of Syria, but the, it's the 20% of Syria that matters that he controls. Because that's where all the port facilities, the industry, that's where you have a lot of the population centers. You know, 50% of Syria is pretty much barren wasteland, so not necessarily as valuable. So the fact that he only controls 20%, but he controls 20% of Syria that, that really matters. So the Russians wanted to make sure he wasn't going to lose any more. And you remember, three months ago, all the predictions were is that Assad had weeks left, you know, that the opposition was on the verge of overthrowing him. They were going to take, they were going to finish the job in Latakia. They were going to march on demand. No one's saying that anymore. The first goal of the Russian intervention has succeeded. Assad has been stabilized. The second proposition is uh, to create a binary choice in Syria the same way as occurred in Algeria in the 1990s. You want to drive so-called moderate groups in one of two directions, either to bring them to come into alliance with the government or to go to the more radical forces. You want to eliminate that middle moderate space that we, the West, the United States, France, we've kind of been depending on this moderate space in the middle that we want to expand so Assad gets crushed here, ISIS gets crushed here. The Russian approach is you take that moderate space, push some of it back towards Assad, push the rest towards ISIS, and then stage two is you then start hammering this kind of rejuvenated extremist group, and then you present the rest of the world with a fait accompli of saying, well, moderates don't exist anymore, so it's Assad or ISIS, and then people come to the conclusion that Assad is a devil you can live with, and ISIS is the target. That's kind of when we look at the Russian strikes, first on kind of solidifying Assad, then going after the moderate groups to kind of say, see, you're not under anyone's protection. The U US, France, Turkey, they're not, Saudi Arabia, they're not protecting you. And now we've had in the past week the strikes in Raqqa and elsewhere. So that appears to be the, the Russian strategy. And my, my guess is that when Iran comes to Moscow on Thursday, uh, that will be, Putin will, Putin will say to him, see, now we've got to concentrate on, on ISIS, and now we have to, we have to join our forces together. And,
Assad has to be a part of that process. The Russians may accept and say, yes, at some point he's going to go. We can sign on to an eventual departure. That would be, and the challenge we will have is that's a reversal for us, because for us and France, we've always said Assad's departure is the upfront condition for partnership. So if we back away from that and say, well, Assad can stay for now, but he has to go in six months or a year or two years, we have to accept that that will mean that we're backtracking from uh, conditions that for the last four years we were insisted was, were non-negotiable in dealing with Syria. So Olan may take that deal. He may not. He may satisfy, <laughs> as we like to do, and say, OK, he has to go. But for six months, we can accept him. I don't know what will happen. But again, watch what happens after Thursday, and we'll get a better idea of that. So. Uh, we'll take a question from Bob yeah, let, uh, I wanted to ask a question about the relations between Germany and Russia. Mm. Uh, and it seems is that is is the German view towards Russia almost as much to balance the U.S. against Russia as anything else. I was over in Berlin in May and saw a series of Russian uh, motorcyclists driving through the yep. city for the entire day, making loud noises. This was at the uh, 75th anniversary of the war yeah. uh, ending. And I just found it to be very uh, interesting because the next day there was no media coverage of this. Yeah. Anyway. The uh, Russian-German relationship and what's happened to it over the last year is a fascinating one because uh, up till 2013, the German position was that, yes, Russia is, has these problems. It has human rights issues. We have these areas of conflict. But really, Russia can be drawn into... Uh, cooperation with Europe, you have to be you know, accommodating, you want stronger economic ties because when the business ties are there, the political ties will follow. Then the Ukraine crisis flares up. And as you recall, the initial reaction, particularly of the Germans, was not to support sanctions. The United States put sanctions on Russia first over Crimea and then over uh, what was happening in Donbass. The Germans and others were resistant. They did go with the sanctions on Crimea, but really it was the downing of the Malaysian airliner that, that changed uh, public opinion in Europe and shifted more strongly. Uh, the other thing, of course, was the personal relationship between Putin and Merkel suffered because Merkel believed that she had been given assurances in the summer of 2014 from Putin that all of this separatist stuff was going to stop, you were going to have a political settlement. Uh, she goes to Brazil, she's announcing things there, and then the fighting continues, and so she feels, and basically, as I've been told, and, and as we can see from the public record, the sense that that was the final straw of, okay, I can't trust him, I can't deal, uh, you know, I can't trust what he says, and that loss of the personal relationship uh, was critical. The German business community has been watching this very, very carefully because they're not happy with sanctions. They went along with it. They're looking to have sanctions removed or modified in 2016. That'll be, so we'll have, the, again, January will be a test, the European sanctions extended. <coughs> What's also happened is that uh, as the German-Russian relationship has faltered, we've seen the rise of the Russian-French relationship. So that Merkel ceases to be the main player in interlock being the interlocutor with Putin. Now it becomes Hollande. And so there's been that migration towards the French. Again, uh, a bell mark to keep an eye on. Nord Stream 2. The Russians have proposed doubling the pipeline capacity from the Bal their Baltic coast to Germany, which allows them to bypass Ukraine, send more gas directly to Germany. Most big German conglomerates are in favor of it. Uh, the hurdle will be the European Commission, because does this project, is it simply an extension of an existing project so that all the old permits still apply, or is it a new project which the European Commission then has to rule on? Uh, the Austrians have already come out and said, this is, you know, we don't want any fooling around. We want this project approved. We'll see what happens with German business. Merkel, of course, also has the problem of a, you know, a political future, uh, watching her numbers go down because of the migrant crisis in Germany. Uh, and so whether or not that will lead her to moderate on Russia also remains to be seen uh, in, the, in the coming years. But uh, yeah, so right now the Germans took a harder line. They convinced other European states to apply 
sanctions pressure, uh, but we are getting some signals that uh, that commitment is weakening uh, and that, again, Hollande may now become the figure who comes back and says, look, we really have to give Russia something on sanctions. Maybe not withdrawing the sanctions, but temporarily suspending a few of them. Maybe on the French energy project in the Arctic. Okay, let's let that one go forward, which of course would benefit uh, Total and a few other companies. Uh, and so again, we'll see that intra-European uh, dialogue between Hollande and Merkel in December in the run-up to the European Commission meeting in January uh, and what happens to sanctions, or if they may come to an agreement, which is we'll let sanctions roll in January, but by June of 2016, uh, they get lifted. Okay, um, thank you. Um, wh what role is India playing, or, or could it play, do you think? Do they have a dog in this fight? Yeah, India has several, several, um, because to the extent that their pivot to the United States has faltered, for a variety of reasons. You had Indians who said, well, we can have this new relationship with Washington that will help us decrease dependence on, on Russia. There's been a pivot back uh, in some ways because, well, can we get the technology we want from the United States, military technology and other things. The energy relationship is quite interesting. Uh, the Indians are bidding for actually having ownership of Russian energy assets. There's now talk about now that the sanctions are lifting on Iran, do you get a uh, pipeline or energy transit to India from Russia through Iran? Uh, and so the Indians are um, pivoting back to Russia to some extent in a way that earlier they were, they were moving away from. Uh, the Indians also have generally tended to be supporters. They like the Russian line on you know, giving the non-Western world more prominence in international institutions. And so uh, the Indians look at a variety of things and say, well, we don't really want to break with the Russians. Uh, also, you know, realpolitik, the Indian claim to Kashmir is disputed in the way that, you know, Russia now claims Crimea uh, and says, well, it's really part of Russia and should have been part of Russia all along. Uh, and so the Indians don't want to uh, take a stand on Russia vis-a-vis -vis Crimea that could then be interpreted as weakening their, their right to have the parts of Kashmir that they control. So you have some of those elements in place uh, as well. Um, also, it depends on what happens with the Russia, sorry, the India-China relationship. Uh, and uh, the Indians need that relationship with Russia as part of their counterbalancing of China. Uh, and the Chinese, of course, I don't know if uh, when you had your uh, when Jim was here, if he addressed that, or with Tim Hoyt was here, but the Chinese, interestingly, have lost. They had an opportunity to really make a breakthrough with the Indians, uh, but the Chinese military seems to have uh, put the kibosh on that, where the Chinese could have really made a demonstration to India of, hey, we want a new relationship with you, and instead they've continued some of that probing on the frontier, uh, which keeps India insecure and, and then keeps New Delhi thinking we, we can't afford to mess up the Russia connection. Also partly because they look at the United States and say the United States is easily distracted. Do we really want to trust Washington with security if we think that Washington can suddenly forget about us? And uh, interesting point too with services, it's also service specific. The Indian Navy, not surprisingly, tends to be very pro-US and you know, we love our Indian Navy officers at Newport but the Indian Army is your bulwark of your stronger ties with Russia. The land and air forces tend to still think of Russia as their indispensable security partnership. So within the Indian military, you see some cleavages there about who's the greater security partner. Our last question for this session. All right. You were talking about the uh, uh, issue of assistance to Ukraine. How do you... Uh, suggest we find a balance between supporting the government of Ukraine and the traditional politicians and at the same time not losing uh, legitimacy with the more Maidan oriented yeah. people like Mustafa Nayam, uh, Mustafa Nayam and people like that. Because from what I hear in Kiev, a lot of people actually would like us to give less aid until they uh, resolve the issues with Shokin and so on and so forth. Yeah. 
Uh, let me be honest, I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, I don't know how we get out of that dilemma of do we give aid and then hope that more aid and then hope that that induces change? Do we sort of withhold aid as a way to force change and then show that when you've made certain steps, we'll give the aid? I mean, part of the problem is, is that, and uh, you know, I, was, I happened to be in, in, in Brussels earlier this year, we're dealing with the reality that you know, Ukraine's been in transition for 25 years. I mean, this is year 25 of reform and aid and assistance. And it's really hard to keep saying, well, this is now going to be different. So yeah, I don't, have a, I don't have a good answer for you because I look back and say these things should have been happening in 2007 and 2005 and you can't just compress it now in a matter of months to make it work. Um, so you know, do, you, you know, do you provide more assistance to help through the, you know, the energy transition uh, you know, more, more uh, you know, to, to enable U the Ukrainian economy to, to wean itself off of the low cost waste energy that it was doing before? Uh, you do it in a way that doesn't empower oligarchs, because that, of course, has been a big, big source of oligarch strength in Ukraine is manipulation of the energy sector. Do you, you know, remove oligarchs first and then hope that you get a transition, or do you have to work? I, it, it really becomes problematic. And now that you have election results coming in from the regional elections, which show reform fatigue and, and people saying you haven't delivered on promises and the like, uh, I really don't know how you move forward. Uh, and then also reform fatigue here. I just don't see the resources being generated. Uh, my colleague at the War College, Ambassador John Cloud, recommended him as a speaker, hint, hint, uh, yet another naval war call. He was, uh, played a big role in helping with the assistance packages in 1989. And he said, if you look at what the US did in 1989, we criticized Japan for offering loan guarantees. We said you should be offering grants. Now, what are we offering Ukraine? We're offering loan guarantees. We're not offering grants. We're not offering you know, large amounts of untied aid. We're, we're saying here you can, we'll guarantee you to go out and borrow money to, to do something. So, uh, you know, part of this I think has to come back to a more fundamental question is we have to go back and think through the Uni European Union and the United States. What's the Ukraine end state that we want and what are we willing to pay for? And if we can answer those questions, then we can get to these other questions of how big the packages should be and, and what we're prepared to do. But, you know, uh, unfortunately, I've heard some real happy talk out of people in Washington who say, oh, the crisis is on its way through. Ukraine is really moving forward. Things are good. And thinking, are, are you looking at the same Ukraine that I'm looking at? I mean, yes, there's positive developments. But as a whole, I mean, there's some real structural problems that you know, haven't been addressed, which, as you pointed out, you know, chicken and egg, more aid now, fix the structural problems, or you know, fix the structural problems first and then provide the aid. So a long, again, a long way, a long-winded way of saying I don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. We ask uh, all of our speakers to kind of look at the chessboard and explain the plays that are going on. I think in Nick's case, this was a three-dimensional chessboard. So uh, we thank you very much for a very lucid explanation of these events. Uh, I hope you all have a uh, restful Thanksgiving. I say that because you will need to rest because next week we have uh, Will McCants on his book, The ISIS Apocalypse, on December 1. We have Adam Garfinkel on December 2 on the Middle East and Europe after Paris. And we have Renz Lee and Aunt Lucan on the Russian Far East and new East Asian dynamics. So uh, one program a day. Uh, we hope you will join us for that. As we near the end of the year, if you're not now a member of FPRI, we hope you'll join. If you are a member, we hope you'll upgrade to a higher level. We thank you for joining us tonight, and see you next time.